Good evening, church family. How are we doing? So good to see you all. Welcome to our Good Friday service. This is by far uh, my most favorite service that I get to be a part of. As we uh, gather around, as you can see, we're in the round. We're gathering around uh, the body and the blood of Christ uh, to remember, to proclaim the Lord Jesus, his death until he returns. Such a beautiful night to get to celebrate our Lord. Amen. Uh, let's stand. Let's enter into worship. I want to pray before we get started. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you, Father, for giving us life through your son's death. Thank you that this was your plan all along.
with your kindness you chase me down when I was lost where would I be if it wasn't for the cross hallelujah Yeah. 
humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Father, what a gift it is that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And those who plunge themselves beneath it find cleansing from all their guilt and stains. Lord, it is such a privilege to celebrate the pinnacle of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, as we set our attention and our sights on Christ and him crucified on that Friday, which to us is good, because three days later he rose from the dead, meaning what he was doing on that cross was substitutionary and sacrificial on behalf of others, on behalf of sinners like us, so that we could be set free. Father, would you grip our hearts with the stunning salvation secured for us by Jesus Christ on that cross and applied to us by your spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen. I would encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word as we come to our verses for this evening. Good Friday, Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, and they will be on the screens for you. This is the word of the Lord for today. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. This is the word of the Lord for this evening. May the Lord write its eternal truths on your hearts. You can be seated. Church, it's so good to be together, isn't it? Like what a privilege it is to gather for Good Friday. And I think, Ben, you stole the words right out of my mouth. This is maybe my favorite service of the entire year. Like I look forward to this. I know many of you do. And so just happy Good Friday. Isn't it a blessing we can call it good? Right? Anyone just reflecting on that today? What an apologetic to a world that does not know why we're gathering together today, and all you have to do is describe the word good to them. The reason that it is good is because Jesus was doing something to save sinners, amen? And so we celebrate that today, and we're going to celebrate it by jumping into Hebrews 9, and so if you uh, want to take notes or you just want to listen, I uh, would encourage you to... Uh, 
Get yourself ready. Get yourself to Hebrews chapter 9 is where we're going to be. And um, man, just so excited for what the Lord has in this text for us. The title of the message for this evening is Death, the Price. All right, Death, the Price. And I recognize the fact that anytime you take uh, a sermon and you come out of a series and you jump into like the ninth chapter of something, we're a church that really cares about context, right? So I'm not just going to make that say whatever I want it to say. We're going to have to figure out what it means. And so in order to get to Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to have to get you through Hebrews chapters 1 through 8 quickly. As quick as I can do it, right? And so I, I actually, I came up with an illustration to summarize the first eight chapters. And I know it's dangerous to do that. But I, I think I'm up for the challenge, and, and I want you to come with me on this journey. So I, w- I want you to imagine for a second uh, you had this desire to have kids, and you couldn't have kids on your own, but you got a promise from God that God would bring you, who can't have kids on your own, children. And in the meantime, between the promise of God saying, I'm going to bring you children, and the reality of you having children, God says along the way, I'm going to give you clues I'm going to give you puzzle pieces, and they're going to be little pieces of what your kids are going to be like, so you have this anticipatory sense of what you're looking forward to. And as you gather those puzzle pieces together and you start putting them together, they frame this beautiful picture of what your kids will be like. And so you gather them, and it's probably something like this. And you start to put all the pieces together, and you're like, wait, that's a hand. Like, that's the, that's the silhouette of a girl. Or a dude with the man bun, we're not sure, but that, I think that's, that's a girl, and how exciting is that? And, and years and years go by, and man, you're just glued to the silhouette because you're like, I just can't wait, it's so exciting. But picture God delivering those children, and, and just for the sake of illustration, stork style, all right? He brings these children, this age, to your front door. And imagine hearing their voices and imagine them coming into the house and saying, hey, mom, hey, dad, and you are so focused on the silhouette, you miss the presence of the children altogether. That is exactly what's happening in the book of Hebrews. Let me give it to you like this. Adam and Eve, our first parents, made in the image of God. You and I, made in the image of God. Even better, made for relationship with God. Now, sin severed that relationship. But right after sin severed that relationship in the book of Genesis, God was already promising return in right relationship to him. So the sin that severed that right relationship with God, God promised to reestablish He promised to provide a way for full, final, and eternal access to God. Now, in the in-between, the promise and the fulfillment of the promise, he was going to supply puzzle pieces, if you will. Little glimpses into, if you put this together, right? Take the priesthood, and you take the sacrifices, and you take the old covenant, and you start weaving together this picture, you're going to get this beautiful silhouette. And of course, who's the silhouette of? you start to begin to see that that silhouette is Jesus. Now imagine the silhouette's got good news for us, right? In the sense that it points us to that redeemer that God promised to bring us back into right relationship with God. But it's also true that the silhouette did something for the saints of the Old Testament. It did actually accomplish something. It just wasn't sufficient. So imagine you're holding on to the picture of the old covenant and the priesthood and the sacrifices and the one in whom the silhouette picture shows up in human flesh, lives, dies, and rises, and you're committed to the picture instead of the Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what's happening in the book of Hebrews. And so one of those pictures that the Old Testament gives us is the picture of a priesthood. And the entire book of Hebrews really is a one after another after another going, hey, that picture in the Old Testament, that prophet from the Old Testament, that priesthood from the Old Testament, that sacrifice from the Old Testament, good stuff. But man, it pointed to something better. It pointed to someone who could actually save you from your sins eternally. And so as we jump into the text today, we're going to see this supremacy of Christ. In particular, because it's Good Friday, I wanted to focus on Christ's priesthood. 
Because when you think about Good Friday, when you think about the cross, you realize that that is a work of a priest, that Good Friday is all about Jesus, the great high priest. And in Jesus Christ, we have Jesus is the priest, Jesus is the sacrifice, and Jesus is the altar upon which he makes sacrifice for sins. And so the whole point is put away the silhouette, put away the picture, and be drawn to the substance who is Jesus. And so big idea for this evening is this. Jesus' priesthood accomplishes the salvation that the old priesthood couldn't. And that's good news for us on Good Friday. Jesus' priesthood accomplishes the salvation that the old couldn't. Get your eyes off of the shadows. Get them onto the substance of Jesus, and you'll see the supremacy of Christ in every way. Listen, if you have been coming to Good Friday services for 10, 15, 20, 25 years, here's the glory of this moment, right? You know these truths, but you need to be gripped by them again, right? And the worst thing that could happen is you know it so well, you don't allow yourself to be gripped by what you see in the word of God. And for those of you who don't know Jesus, my hope is that in breaking this text down, you will come face to face with the God who loves you and the Jesus who came to die for you. Gripped by a salvation secured for us in Jesus. All right. Well, how is Jesus priesthood? which accomplishes the salvation that the old couldn't, how is it better? How is Jesus' priestly ministry better? Jesus being the priest, the sacrifice, and the altar. How is it better? Well, it's better in three ways according to this text. Number one, the office he occupies is better. Number two, the sanctuary he ministers in is better. And number three, the sacrifice he offers is better. So we're going to take each one as we go. Number one, the office he occupies is better. Now, it starts with the word but. But when Christ appeared, now, jumping into this text, we have to understand he's coming out of an argument, right? So let's roll back a few verses and let's see what's going on. Verse six, he's talking about the priestly function of the Levitical priesthood in the Old Testament goes to the basic sacrifices in verse 6. These preparations having been made, the priest goes regularly into the first section performing their ritual duties. Verse 7, though, he changes. But into the second, meaning the most holy place, only the priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good to come, something substantively different happened. Now, here's what's crazy about this. The office he occupies is better, meaning that he is a better priesthood, right? That's the idea, that Jesus has a better priesthood. Now, he's comparing it against the pinnacle worship event of the old covenant people of God, namely the day of Sweet, atonement, okay? That day where it was the only day that the high priest could go into the temple, which symbolized the dwelling place of God, not just into the temple, but into the most holy place in the temple, presenting blood as a sacrifice for sins, because of course the wages of sin is death, and this was to symbolize this one who would come and bring a blood that would be sufficient. Now that day of atonement sacrificial offering was a way to cleanse the sin from just the last year. And so he would go and he would do this, and it was this high point of worship, this 
greatest point of access to God in the Old Testament. You had your sins cleansed for an entire year. It was good, but it wasn't permanent. Now, when Jesus appears, redemption that the Day of Atonement was only pointing to and only temporary and limited and imperfect in its effectiveness, Christ actually accomplishes. Now, we see the significance of this because the office he occupies is better. He comes with a better priesthood. It's, first of all, because he comes with a better name. It doesn't say when the next Levite in line appeared as a high priest, but rather when Christ appeared as a high priest. That is massively significant. We would be expecting the priesthood would pass on from one generation to the next generation to the next generation of Levites. This says when Christ appeared. Significant maybe for us, but maybe not. But to these people, to the Hebrews, the name Christ the Messiah, the promised one, in whom all of their desires and expectations were to be fixed. They were anticipating. They even had a name for this one who was to come. They knew there was a redeemer all the way back in Genesis 3 that was to come. That's why in Matthew chapter 11, they say, are you the one who is to come? It was the name they gave to the Messiah, the one who would come, the one who would come and he would accomplish what God promised all throughout the Old Testament, this is the one who has appeared. And in appearing, the significance of that word is not just that he shows up, but that in showing up, he actually accomplishes what God gave him to do. So when it says Christ appeared as a high priest, meaning Christ accomplished, actually did what God promised, securing better effects than the Day of Atonement and the priests of old could ever do. Notice it says, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. No high priest in the old covenant could bring the good things that have come through Jesus. They could picture it. They could offer it in part, but they could not bring it in full. They could not bring the quality of good that the Lord desires here. They could not secure those promises which the Lord has for his people. And maybe the best way to summarize what that is is at the end of verse 12, securing an eternal redemption. That Christ came, he appeared, he accomplished what was needed to secure for you and for me an eternal redemption. Not a temporary redemption, not an annual reprieve from sin, but a all the way into eternity reprieve from sin. This good stuff is not like good as we would um, talk about it. Like God brings me good things and by that I mean God does for me whatever I want him to do for me. This is him saying God brings you the things you need for the sake of your soul, but because of sin, has been just woefully distorted. The Bible describes us as being dead in our trespasses and sins, right? We're alive physically, but spiritually we're dead. We have no, no sensitivity to the Lord. And yet there's this groaning inside of us because we're image bearers of God that, that we, we want a, a, some sort of a relationship with God, but we grope after it in the darkness. And Christ has come and he's come to provide a reconciled relationship with the Lord. He's come on um, we celebrate this on Good Friday. He's come to live and then ultimately to die to actually make atonement for our sins. He came to pay the penalty for your sins before a holy God. He came to, in paying for those sins, in making atonement, carry away the guilt from the sins that you've committed as far as the East is from the West. He came so that you, though separated because of your sin from a right relationship with God, to be reconciled with God. See, here's the thing that happens. We, we sin, and often we know it. And sin causes a couple things. Because we have consciences, it causes us to walk away from him because we get this sense of guilt. And then we separate ourselves from God. And we just kind of plug our ears and pretend that God's not a reality or a thing or I don't need God or whatever. And that's the sinner's way of dealing with the lack of rest in the heart. 
And what Christ does is he comes and he deals with the guilt that you bear because of sin by offering himself as a sacrifice. He atones for your sin. And then he also cleanses you from your sin. He renews you from the inside out so that you can now approach God with boldness and you can have peace with God through reconciled relationship with Jesus and the righteousness that you lack. He actually lived a perfect life. Like he perfectly lived the law of God. He even submitted himself to the penalty of the law of God for you so that you could have his righteousness and he could pay your penalty. These are just some of the good things. More of the good things would be that now when we worship the Lord, that worship is made acceptable to God because it comes through the work of Jesus Christ. But the promises of God are yes and amen for those who are in Jesus Christ. That we can be the ones who know that God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I mean, the, the list of good goes on and on and on and on. And because he is the greater high priest, the Christ, who secures better effects from his work as priest, we have this hope. And so we don't, we don't lightly, we don't take this lightly. We don't despise the good things that are to come. We receive them as they are available in Jesus Christ. And you and I celebrate them. We, we ought to be gripped by them. We ought to contemplate the goodness of God to us in Jesus. Jesus' priesthood accomplishes the salvation that the old couldn't first because the office he occupies is better. He occupies it with a better name and he secures better effects. But then number two, the sanctuary that he ministers in is better. Every worker needs a workplace, right? Except for, I guess, these days, people working at home and doing whatever they want. But it used to be a day where people would go to work. Priests need sanctuaries. That's what they do. They go, they do their work at the sanctuary. Every priest needs a sanctuary. Jesus is the same way. Jesus comes as the great high priest. And what the Hebrew writer is saying is, priestly ministry is better precisely because he operates out of a superior sanctuary. Now, he describes it in two ways. How is this true? Well, he says there's a double positive to it and there's a double negative to it. Greater and more perfect, double positive, not made with hands, not of this creation, double negative. And what's he talking about here? But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, that which pertains to that eternal redemption Jesus brings and provides for us in his own lifeblood, then it says, then through the greater and more perfect tent. He starts there with the positive. The tent in which the Lord Jesus ministers is both greater and more perfect. That is that Christ came as God's own tabernacle. He comes and operates in human flesh. And so what they're used to in the Old Testament is they would, they would, the tabernacle was, a, was animal skins put together and built into a tent to, like I said, represent the dwelling place of God. But when Jesus came, the second person of the Trinity became a high priest for us, he, he occupied a better tent. He, he enfleshed himself. He became human like one of us, and, and the priestly work that he did, he did in human flesh. This is the idea. And as such, it's greater. Why is it greater? Well, it's greater because all the fullness of deity needed to dwell somewhere, as Colossians 2 would say. And what better place to dwell than in human flesh so that he could do for us what we could not do for ourselves? That John, when John 1.14 says, and the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory. They, he says, glory is of the only son from the father. He's saying this is greater. This tent in his body that Jesus operates in is a greater tent than the old covenant tent. Not to mention the fact that the priests knew even from old that sacrifices and offerings you've not desired but a body you have prepared for me. 
Like if he came in anything less than human flesh, it wouldn't have been sufficient to cover our sins. He needed to come in human flesh. The God-man, the second person of the Trinity, had to take on human flesh in order to save us. Because he came and ministered in a better sanctuary, he was able to provide for us what we need to be saved from our sin. But then he describes it in a negative way. Not made with hands, that is not of this creation. The whole thing was interesting about the old covenant is that you build this tent, and yet the whole time the declaration is, do you remember when they build a temple, what Solomon says? 1 Kings 8, it says, Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I built for you. So they built it knowing that it wasn't sufficient, didn't meet the holy habitation standards of the Lord. But they did it anyway. Acts 17, 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man. This couldn't be the end. The tent of the tabernacle couldn't be the end. Acts 7.48 says the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. How did he deal with this? How did he come and minister among us in a way that it's not something human made, not of this creation? You go, well, he's human. What do you mean he's not human made? Yes, he's of the same stuff of us, but he wasn't produced in the same way. It's like those Ford commercials, right? Where it's like built different. And it's like this masculine thing and they're just, they're set apart. And some of you are like, amen, right? Built different. Jesus is of the same stuff as us, but he's built different than us. He didn't come by procreation in the way the rest of us did. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and something supernatural took place and the production of that coming to, uh, you know, birth of Jesus Christ was wrought by the Holy Spirit. Yes, flesh of our flesh, but production-wise, not the same. And that human nature was, di- was united to that divine nature in one person. So as God, he could perfectly well, he, as God, he could represent us, and as man, he could pay the penalty for our sin and perfectly obey the law of God. Jesus' priesthood accomplishes the salvation the old couldn't because the office he occupies is better. The sanctuary of his own flesh he ministers in is better, coming in human flesh. And number three, the sacrifice that he offers is better And he gives four ways in which is the case. What ways is the sacrifice he offers better? Well, he enters a better holy place. He brings a better blood. The offering he submits is better. And the redemption he offers is, or he brings and secures is better. This is the heart of Good Friday, right? This death on the cross, this one who came and died, what ways is it better? Well, notice what it says. It says, even through the great, even through the, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he, Jesus, embodied in human flesh, died, rose, and in human flesh, ascended, entered once for all into the holy places, Okay? The holy places Jesus enters is better. The old covenant priests would have entered beyond the veil in that cube that was in the temple. Jesus ascends and goes to the place that the old covenant tabernacle or temple, holy of holies, merely pictured. This was just like a, like a, way, like a silhouette, like a shadow. But Jesus entered into that place, the heaven of heavens. Psalm 115 says, the nations mock believers saying, where is their God? And the psalmist says, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. This is where Jesus went, into the presence of the majesty and the glory of God. He entered the true holy places after which the tent and the tabernacle Holy of Holies only pictured. 
And in his entering, he entered not by means of the blood of goats and calves, not by animal blood. And again, here's this comparison. You had the old covenant priest who would enter with blood of animals as a substitutionary sacrifice, as an offering that, listen, the wages of sin is death and something has died in our place. And God accepted that in a temporary and limited and imperfect sense. He was the reason Jesus is better is because he took his own blood with him into heaven. Now, some people get weird on this and go, like, he literally took his own blood that he shed on the cross. It's not literal like he took his own blood, but by virtue of his own blood that he shed, he pleads that blood in heaven for us. He took a better blood into a better holy place, thus offering a better offering. He entered once for all into the holy places. What's the contrast? The old covenant priests, they'd go in all the time. You had sacrifices that were morning and evening every single day, all the time. And then you had the day of atonement that was kind of a special sacrifice and they're going in all the time. Over and 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 over again. And every time, it secures a temporary reprieve. There's a sense of relief. There's a sense of atonement happening, but it was never sufficient. But then Christ comes, he sheds his own blood, and it says, once for all, to secure an eternal redemption. Old priests, over and over and over and over again, impact, temporary. Jesus, once, impact, eternal. This is the better blood. What's cool about this is it's more than that. In the old covenant, the priest could go in on your behalf. You couldn't go with the priest. He brought you on his shoulders and he brought you on his heart, that ephod that he was wearing, but you couldn't go in with the priest. What's so awesome about Jesus is that the minute he goes in, he takes all of his followers with him. Right? Think about Ephesians 2 for a second. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were children of wrath like the rest of mankind, but God, two best words in the whole Bible, made you alive, right? Because of the great love with which he loved you. He made you alive and he seated you at, in the heavenlies with Jesus Christ. Right? So he doesn't just go for you. He goes and hauls you in and says, on the basis of my work, you can stay in the presence of God forever. So while you live wherever you live, you live in Rockland, you live in Lincoln, you live somewhere, you're visiting friends, you live somewhere physically, but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you live permanently in the heavenly places. More than that, that reality of the heavenly places living with you is true wherever you go because the Holy Spirit dwells in your heart. A down payment of the reality that is to come. And so this is the profound nature of what God has done. He has brought you, Jesus has brought you into the heavenlies, into the presence of God so that you would have his presence continually forever. It's literally where you dwell spiritually. It's like Colossians 3 says, like one of the best verses, right? That you are hidden with Christ in God because of Jesus. And as a result of entering into a better holy place with his own blood, which enabled him to only go one time to secure an eternal redemption, that redemption that he brings is simply better. Again, you go back to the Old Covenant, you go back to the Old Testament, it was silhouettes, it was shadows, there were good things going on. The high priest could secure redemption for the people for a year. But here, here's one of the things. When he would go on the Day of Atonement, he would offer the sacrifices on behalf of himself and all of the people and the weird part about it is it would just take care of last year, but it was never forward-facing. So think about how discouraging that is. You're celebrating your sins in the past, 
but you don't get one ounce into the future, not one minute. You have to wait a whole nother year for that atoning work to take place in that kind of crescendo sense that the Day of Atonement brought. In Jesus Christ, by faith in him alone, he reaches back to the very first sin you ever committed. He deals with the fact that you're born with a sin nature, right? That you're Adam's progeny. So so because you're an image bearer, because you're a human, you just come out of the gates with his, the result of his sin bears its weight on your nature. And so that's why you don't have to teach kids to do sinful things. They just come out of the gates knowing how to do it, right? No one's ever had to say, hey, could you be less obedient, right? I'm just really struggling right now. There's a reason for that. Jesus is able to reach all the way back to cleanse your nature and deal with every sin you've ever committed all the way in the back, all the way into the present, and all the way into the future. That's the security you have. That even the sins you've yet to commit, Jesus Christ, that blood shed on the cross that we celebrate at Good Friday is sufficient to cleanse all of that sin. Redemption's a cool word. It's a word that means deliverance from bondage by a price paid. The bondage was because of sin. Our sin submitted us to a kind of bondage that we could not get out of. And because of God's great love for us, in fact, John Owen would say it like this, the fire that kindled the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was his own love. That love that God has is so significant that he would send his only begotten son. If there was any other way, it would have been done. It shows how serious the sin issue is, that nothing less than the son of God dying on a cross in a torturous, debased way was the only thing that would suffice. But because he loves us, he went right to the cross, and then he went right into the holy places pleading his work on your behalf. He doesn't do take backs. He doesn't make an apology. He doesn't expect. He loves you for who you are today, not who you will be. And when you screw up in the future, he's going, look at my work. I plead my blood on their behalf for that sin and for every other sin until you are brought home to glory and the shackles fall off in their consummate sense and you enjoy the Lord forever. That's the good news of Good Friday. Let's pray. Father, it's such a blessing to think over the glory of Jesus on that cross, his suffering, his dying, for us. Lord, I pray that you would work to bring the good news to bear on the souls of those who are represented here, the souls of those who are listening in. God, that you would do a work that only you can do and draw people to yourself, granting them repentance and faith that they would turn and trust in Jesus Christ alone for their salvation and their forgiveness and their reconciliation with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
trials come, I will sing for joy. When the ache won't stop, I will make this my battle cry. In life, in death, my confidence. Nothing will ever shake. Nothing can ever break. Nothing can ever take me away from you. as we enter into a time of communion and self-reflection. I want us to fix our eyes on Jesus, his body, his blood. Tonight is a celebration of Jesus, his body broken and his blood shed for sinners. We celebrate that we can have fellowship with the living God who has reconciled us to himself. Through the complete work of Christ on the cross, his death, his burial and his resurrection. Christ is our perfect Passover. God has passed over our sins by pouring out his wrath on Jesus who became sin for us. And as a result, we have become grafted into God's family as his children through faith in Jesus as the Lord, trusting alone in this finished work. And so we celebrate tonight. We celebrate as his children, amen? not only in fellowship with the God who created us, but in fellowship with one another. This meal that we partake in, it identifies us as those who belong to God. Those who have trusted Jesus for salvation, who have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, who have received grace upon grace and have been adopted into sonship by God the Father. Let that sink in. As we look across the room tonight, through the elements on the table representing the body and blood of Jesus, we intentionally see one another. We see who also Christ died for. Our brothers and sisters purchased into God's family. We take this meal as a remembrance of what Christ has accomplished. We take this meal as a present participation in his grace extended to us through the body and blood. And we take this meal as we look forward to Christ's return, amen? That one day he will return and finally have again this meal with us in the new heaven and new earth. A charge to the believer tonight concerning the table, we're not to take this meal in an unworthy manner as scripture tells us, but we're to consider the reality and the significance concerning the body and blood of our Lord. 
We are to examine ourselves before the Lord, asking the Spirit to search our hearts, confessing our sin, and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup, according to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight. And if you're not in unrepentant sin or under church discipline, you're welcome to the table tonight. And for those brothers and sisters who fall into one of those categories currently, the charge to you is to first restoration and reconciliation to rejoin the fellowship of believers. And if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus, would you abstain from taking this meal tonight? This meal is reserved for the family of God. Rather, this meal is an invitation to you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to confess with your mouth that he is Lord, to believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you will be saved, attaining the same adoption into sonship, fellowship with the family of God, and reconciliation to the God who created. And so tonight, before we come to the table, let us all, we're going to take some time and examine ourselves before the Lord concerning the body and the blood. And your cue to get up and come receive the elements is when the pastors and elders come and grab the elements and stand in place surrounding the table, ready to administer communion to you. You'll take the elements back to your seat, and then Pastor Zach will come up and lead us in taking together. And so let's take a seat. And let's spend some time, let's, let's examine ourselves before the Lord.
church, it's this moment, 2,000 years ago, where Christ, our great high priest, secures for us an ultimate and final redemption. And so it's this moment when then Christ descends into death. And as he descends, he's already claimed it is finished. There's no more work to be done. There's only Sabbath rest for him as he lay in the grave. And so he goes on what we'll call a victory lap. He proclaims victory to the saints, the Old Testament saints that are held within Hades. He releases the doorway to Abraham's bosom. They empty out into paradise. And he descends to hell to proclaim victory against the evil spiritual forces. And so to focus on this descent, I'm gonna read a poem from Samuel Renahan. And in this poem, he wants to focus on how Satan is put to open shame in the descent of Christ. Renahan refers to Satan by an Old Testament moniker, Azazel, and he says that though he conspired against God, desiring to put him to death, that because Satan could not escape the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, God used Satan's devices against him. Satan, who hates God's glory, participates in the very thing that he hates, atoning sacrifice. And so Satan plays pawn into his own demise. Our God is so good. He's so glorious. He uses all. Nothing can escape the foreknowledge and plans that he puts forth. He's so mighty. And so as we focus on this moment in redemptive history, I'm going to read this poem, and then I'll lead us through taking the elements. He whose body was entombed went down in soul below to free us from our darkest doom and make an open show. Of all the hosts in Hades well and all the devil spawn, that we might never have to dwell or fear where he had gone. O oh, Azazel, you wasteland haunt, what happened to your goat? Why do you now no longer vaunt or taunt or flaunt or gloat? Perhaps it was this simple act that left you thus confined. Perhaps it is this simple fact that eats and gnaws your mind, that you yourself became a priest that slew the Paschal Lamb, and thus defeat and downfall came about by your own hand. Crux mors in feri salus nostra est. Our sins have been removed as far as east is from the west. For he has paid our ransom price, his death has set us free, and in his resurrected life we live eternally. Let all in heaven, earth, and hell who hear his holy name incline the head and bow the knee, let every mouth proclaim. We now confess that Jesus Christ is Savior, King, and Lord, worthy to be loved and served and honored and adored. Demons, spirits, all who live, pay tribute and applaud. Angels, saints, praise Jesus Christ. Praise him, the Son of God. Amen. Yes, amen. When the Lord Jesus was gathered with his disciples, he gave thank, thanks and taking bread, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Church, as often as you take this bread and take the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Will you stand and continue in worship with us?
He's acquainted with our grief. A man of sorrow, son of suffering. Blood and tears, how can it be? There's a God who weeps. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who will reach for. Son of Son. 